Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream, and they should not return, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. May the reader and the hearer. Well, I've never been in this situation before. I've never retired before, but I've moved from a lot of churches. In fact, at the minister's meeting we had uh, about 10 days ago, they asked me to name all the churches that I had been at. And I knew that putting me on the spot, I'd probably miss some, and I did. And fortunately, none of the churches heard that uh, I'd forgotten them. Um, and I was telling them that my late wife and I were married 20 years, and we moved 31 times. And we used to have the boxes, and we'd save the boxes, we'd collapse them, and when we were ready to move, we'd just put them back together, retake them, and we'd see what it said on the box goes in there. And um, that was part of the great Advent movement. Uh, they, they considered moving us many times was a good thing. My first church was actually just for three months, and I worked at English Oaks Church in Lodi. And from there I went to Modesto, and from there to Santa Cruz. And uh, from Santa Cruz, I went to Mariposa and Merced. And from Mariposa and Merced, I went to... Cambridge Park in San Jose and Robert, that's where I met you. So I've known I've known Robert a long time. We go back over 30 years uh, that I was at Cambridge Park. And from there, um, I went to Iowa. And from Iowa, I came back and uh, went to Fresno. And uh, from Fresno, I went to Campbell. And from Campbell, I went to the churches of the peninsula. I actually had Palo Alto, Redwood City, Burlingame, and South San Francisco. Uh, and then came here, Livermore and Fremont. Oop, I knew I was going to forget one. Uh, I forgot. Uh, I was also at the Santa Rosa Church for a year. Uh, so many, many churches, many, many people. And uh, really, Robert, to have you here today, I was surprised. There you are, Robert. Uh, because, yeah, we go back a long way. I think you remember one of my early sermons in Cambrian Park. Uh, I have long since forgotten them. And, but yet, I remember the first day I preached in Fremont. Was anyone here that day? All I remember about it, I don't remember. I, can you remember what the topic was? It was Nehemiah chapter 1. Does anyone remember that? And I remember I looked at the clock, Pastor, and I got up, and it was my first sermon, and it was almost 12 o'clock. And I thought to myself, should I let everybody out at 12? I'm the new pastor. And I said to myself, i got a 40-minute sermon. Should I go ahead and preach the 40-minute sermon, and everyone's going to get out after 12 o'clock? And I said, but maybe that's the way this church is. Maybe they like to stay till 1 o'clock. Well, you know, nobody said anything to me that day about going that long. But when we had the elders meeting, the elders mentioned it. And I said, well, if you get me up at 10 to 12, then I'm going until after 12.30. And you know, we sat down, I think the elders will remember this, we sat down and said, what are some of the things that we can cut to get the pastor up early? Well, if you look at the clock today, they did pretty well. They got me up almost at 20 to 12. But guess what? You're not getting out. <laughs> Don't think about it. 
This week I was so surprised because Kanis and I talked a lot this week about this being my last Sabbath in prison at Fremont. Because I know Fremont Church is going to invite me back just as the Livermore Church will invite me back. Just like I got a call yesterday from my church in South San Francisco. They said, now that you're retired, why don't you come back? And of course, Burlingame has already asked me to come back, so I'm not going to be at a loss for speaking. But this week, as we talked about it, I knew it was going to be something for Caris to focus on. And because um, she really grew up in this church. You might remember when I carried her in, uh, she couldn't walk up the stairs to the fellowship hall. In fact, when she could walk up, she couldn't walk down. She would sit to go down the stairs. And now look at her. She runs all over the place. Uh, I'll always remember the day she took my keys for the car and she lost them here in the church. And how long did we spend looking at it? And she actually put it in the pew rack. And we could not find the keys. And Lawrence was on his way taking me uh, to Redwood City to get my second set of keys. Um, but last night, he didn't even say, Daddy, I'm going to pray at the end of the day. But Daddy prayed, and then before I said goodnight to her, she prayed. You know, I'm always going to remember her prayer because of what she said. And that's what you do with kids. You remember their prayers because you realize what's happening to them. This is what she prayed. She said, Jesus, I know how much you love everybody. She said, our life is so short here. It's about as short as a fruit fly. She said, and I know you even love bad people. You forgive them. But I want to pray for everyone tonight. Are you ready for this? She said, I want to pray for the Fremont Church. I want everybody in that church to live forever. Well, that's what Cadiz prayed. And when I told Christine last night, she said, how did Cadiz know about a fruit fly? And I said, everyone knows a fruit fly lives 51 days. That's all. She looked at our life as being very short compared to what God offers us. Today I want to look with you from Matthew chapter 2. One of the things I used to do when I started as a pastor, I never had Jesus' birth story in December. I always had it in July. So since I'm not going to be here in July, I'm going to have it today. Jesus' birth. You know, sometimes we focus only at his birth in December, and we miss out on what it is. And the great thing about this story is what Matthew says about it. Here in Matthew chapter 2, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi... Or yours may say, wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and then we have come to worship him. Can you imagine how far these people traveled? It wasn't like hopping on your car, Robert, and driving up from Morgan Hill. It wasn't like that. These guys saw a star in the east, and when did they see it? According to what we're going to read here, it says two years. These guys had followed a star for two years? How long would you follow a star? Now, you know I'm not talking about the stars in Hollywood, because I know some of you keep track of them on Twitter. Some of you keep track of them on Facebook. I know that. I see you on about the star in the sky. These guys followed the star. What was it about that star that said, we want to follow you for two years? They left home. You know, we always picture them traveling on camels. We always picture three, but it never says it was three. There could have been ten. There could have been five. We don't know how many of them. 
but they traveled in a group. They saw a star and they followed it. Are you following a star today? Or has the journey gotten too long? They didn't know it was going to Jerusalem. They traveled across the desert. Maybe they went up a rock on the Fertile Crescent and came down. We know that the trip from Jerusalem to Babylon takes about six, seven months if you're walking. But these men followed it for two years. And they said, we want to find out who is him who was born king of the Jews. Now, is Jesus only king of the Jews? Remember, when he died, it was Pontius Pilate who put a plaque above his head that said, this is the king of the Jews. So at the beginning of his life, the Magi recognized him as the king of the Jews. And when he's ready to be crucified, it's Pontius Pilate who also says the king of the Jews. But was he king of the Jews? Remember the statement that Jesus made to Pilate. If these people were my people, they'd be fighting for my release. But this has happened according to God's plan. Jesus didn't come as king of the Jews. Jesus came to save the world. Remember? Chapter 1 of Matthew. What did the angel Gabriel say to Mary? You will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You will name him Emmanuel, God with us. Angel Gabriel didn't say he was king of the Jews. Who said he was king of the Jews? Jesus is king of the universe. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why were they disturbed? Were they disturbed by a group of men following a star for two years? Would you be disturbed by that? Were they disturbed that somebody had been born and they didn't know about it? It says, when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of law and asked them where the Christ would be born, now wait a minute, how does he get from king of the Jews to the Christ? How does King Herod know that there's a connection between the king of the Jews and the Messiah? Herod calls in the chief priest and he says, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? Who said the Messiah was born? What's happening here? Men come looking for the king of the Jews, but now Herod is looking for the Messiah. Are you looking for the Messiah? Or are you looking for king of the Jews? Is there a difference? Big difference. Because Jesus is the Messiah. They said in Bethlehem of Judea, because that's what the prophets have written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel. Let's say he's going to be a king. He's going to be a shepherd. What's the difference between a shepherd and a king? Big difference? The king hires shepherds to take care of the sheep. You understand? Shepherd may own the sheep or may not own the sheep. But according to John chapter 10, Jesus said, he's the good shepherd. He takes care of his sheep. So he owns them. He said somebody who's hired doesn't take care of the sheep. Because when they see the wolf, they run away. What happens when you see the wolf? What happens when you hear the wolf? You run away. Or do you stay alive? What happens if there's no shepherd? <coughs> Who takes care of the sheep? <coughs> Who takes care of them? Anybody? Should the sheep run? Who goes in search of that lost sheep? When Herod called in the Magi secretly and found out 
the exact time that the star, that the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, make a careful search. As soon as you find the child, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. What do you think about that word worship? Does Herod really want to worship the Messiah? Did you come to worship today? What does it mean to be worth, to worship God? You know, it's the three angels' message in Revelation 14 that says, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him. What's worship about? Is worship about you? Or about me? Or about God? What's worship about? It says Abraham took his promised son, Isaac, and he took him to Mount Moriah. And he said, we're going to worship God. Did Isaac feel good about it? Did Abraham feel good about it? They traveled all that way. It says it was a three-day journey. Climb up the mountain. Isaac says, Dad, we got the fire. We got the wood. But where's the sacrifice? I share that verse with you because for them, <laughs> worship was about sacrifice. What about Cain and Abel? They worshiped God. What happened? God was more pleased with Abel's sacrifice <coughs> than he was Cain's. What's this whole concept of worship? Is it about feeling good? I've heard people say, I'm not going to that church because I don't feel good in the worship service. Maybe you don't feel good because you're not supposed to feel good. Maybe God's convicting you of something. People want to go to feel good. So now worship services are based on if you're going to feel good or not. Whatever happened to worshiping God? Herod says, I want to go worship him too. Did he? Yeah, he wanted to go kill him. But you know what? Jesus' time was not yet. He came into the world. there at Cambridge Park. I wasn't getting enough on Bible study. I had a Bible study, study interest. His name was Bill. Every week, Bill watched It Is Written with George Vanderbilt. One day, Bill sent us a request that said, I want to get baptized. They sent me to Carver. I went and visited them. I had a hard time finding it because the address kept leading me to a halfway house. And I said, surely Bill wouldn't be in the halfway house because would somebody in the halfway house be watching Israel? So I decided that this must be the house. So I knocked on the door. And somebody came and I said, you know, I'm here to find Bill. And they yelled in the back, Bill, you've got a visitor. And I can remember I waited and Bill came. He said, how can I help you? And he didn't look me in the face. He was looking down. And I said, are you Bill? And he said, yes. And I said, hi, I'm Tom Dodge. I'm representative from the Written Program. And uh, 
I understand you made a request that you want to get baptized. I said, I'm here to uh, just prepare you for baptism. He said, come on in. So I followed him to his room. And there in his room, it was his own room that he had. And, and I'll tell you, this guy was a reader. A lot of books in the room. So he walked over to his desk. He reached for a book. And he showed me a book written by George Mann. And I said, have you been a viewer for many years? He says, oh yeah, I've been a viewer for many years. And I said, well, tell me why you want to get baptized. And he said, because Jesus was baptized. And I said, well, that's a good reason to get baptized. And I said, we like to prepare you for baptism. And I want to go over some Bible studies. I have a set of Bible studies here. I want to go over with, with them with you. And so I gave him the lessons. And each week I would go back and we'd go over the lessons. He went through the lessons with me. And partway through the lessons, I said to him one day, I said, you know, how do you read the Bible every day? He said, well, I have a system for reading the Bible. And I said, why don't you share it with me? So he gave it to me. I said, this is the Bible study plan that I want. And so I took it home and I modified it and everything. And it was a way to read the Bible, and you would study the Bible every day, and you would study one chapter of the Bible every day, and after three and a half years, you would have studied the whole Bible. And so I started it. Ten years later. I studied the whole Bible. And I want you to know that it's the most rewarding thing that I said. Now I'm going to do it in three and a half years. So in 13 years, I had studied the whole Bible. And my life changed. But there was a verse that kept coming to my mind. I said, if I was to choose one verse in the Bible that I felt summarized everything in the Bible, you know, Pastor, I came down with two verses. The first was not John 3.16. It was actually Genesis 3.15, not 3.16. Okay? And you should know what that is. I shouldn't even have to tell you what that is. God said to Adam and Eve, I will put them in you. And the between his seed and your seed. He will bite his heel and he will crush his heel. Very good verse because it pretty much summarizes our life. But that isn't the verse I'm sure. Because for me, there's one verse. If I only had one verse and I only had to preach one sermon, I would use that verse. And you notice it's being used today. Because I consider it the most important verse in the whole It answers a lot of questions. John. You shouldn't have to look it up. I know I'm, I'm not looking it up. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of that verse. How much that verse means to me. It says that to as many as received. He gives the power, or the authority is a better translation, to become the children of God. Jesus didn't die for just a few. He died for as many. It's not just limited to Jews. It's not just limited to Americans. But it covers everyone. To as many as receive him. He gives the authority. And that's what life is about, receiving Jesus. <clears throat> Herod didn't want to go worship Jesus. He wanted to go sacrifice Jesus. But as I told you, his time had not yet come. That's why an angel goes to Joseph. Why did he go to Mary? An angel goes to Joseph and tells him the dream. As far as we know from the record of Matthew, when the angel visited Mary, he visited first. But when the angel spoke to Joseph, he only spoke to him in a dream. Significant. 
the angel tells Joseph, you better get up and go. Joseph was a little bit late getting to Bethlehem. How do we know? He waited until Mary was just about due before he made the trip. Now, for those of you who want to know, Nazareth is 70 miles to Jerusalem. Now, just think for a minute. 70 miles from here. If there's no traffic, the way some of you drive, you can make it in less than an hour. Okay? If there's traffic, it may take you an hour and a half. But they were walking. Remember, a lot of times we think Joseph was a carpenter. <coughs> Actually, the Greek word is not carpenter. We translate it today as either handyman or jack of all trades. You understand the difference? By saying the word means carpenter, you're not saying what Joseph really did. Joseph was a handyman. You know, you have a problem with the plumbing, you call it Joseph, even though they didn't have plumbing. He wasn't just a carpenter. He did everything. And he waited until the last minute to travel those 70 miles. And so when he got to Bethlehem, what do we all know about Bethlehem? There was no rooms available. But wait a minute. Joseph is from Bethlehem. He, he must have had family there. Why didn't he contact family, or did he contact family? I can only tell you this, all of the family that I know, and now you guys are my family. If I'm passing through Fremont, I have a place to stay, isn't that right? If I'm in San Jose, i got a place to stay, right? If I'm in Morgan Hill, i got a place. You understand what I'm saying? You knew when my car died out there in the middle of nowhere on Christmas, and the tow truck driver told me in San Jose, you know what I did. I got on the phone and called somebody I know in San Jose. I remember this truck driver looked at me and he said, how can you get here? You don't live in San Jose. How can you call somebody and know they're going to come get you? You mean to tell me Joseph had no relatives in Bethlehem? I believe he had relatives. Could it be that Joseph didn't want questions asked? After all, they were not married, were they? He didn't go to his relatives. He went to the Motel 6. Who would want to have a baby at Motel 6? Anybody? And there was no room for them. They ended up in a stable. What do you think the angels thought? What do you think the angels thought? He wasn't king of the Jews. He was king of the universe. What do you think they thought? Could it have reminded him of creation? When God created all the animals, were they watching as God took the dirt? formed it together, breathed into that mud, and man became a living being. Could it have been the same witness? Now God is coming into the earth, and where is he? The angels couldn't wait to sing his praise and glory. But where was everybody else? Who was there to welcome him? Is that all? Who's going to be here to welcome Jesus when he comes? It says people will say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. They don't even want to see Jesus. Who's going to welcome him when he comes? 
He said, will I even find faith on the earth when I come? Who's going to welcome him? Sports players get a parade in Washington, D.C. What's Jesus going to get when he comes? Probably the same treatment he got when he was born here. He came to his own, and his own wouldn't even receive him. He was a Jew. He was from the tribe of Judah. He was from the lineage of David. He was from the rib of Adam. Who was there? It says when they came, they found him in the house. He was finally out of the state. Somebody let Joseph and Mary stay at their house. Did these people know who he was? Did he just look like a baby boy to them? Notice verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming into the house, they saw the child and his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. What do you think? Don't say they saw Joseph. Where was Joseph? Say it. He was out working. Saw the child, they saw the mother, and they worshiped. Can you see Jesus today in worship? They did. It's interesting what it says here. They then opened their treasures and presented it in gifts of gold and incense. So worship has to do with giving? What's that? They worshiped him. And they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we realize <laughs> these were used for Mary and Joseph to travel. Were the gifts closed? It's an interesting word here. It's used elsewhere in Scripture. But we're going to look at one of those. What happens when they recognize that Jesus is the Messiah? They open their treasures. And give them. It reminds me of a story in John chapter 4 of the woman at the well. She goes and tells the Samaritans, we found the Messiah. It says they open their homes to him. And remember the disciples said, Jesus, I'm not sure we should be doing this. And even as we get to John chapter 6, the midpoint of Jesus' life, the feeding of the 5,000 men besides women and children, Jesus sends the disciples away. The people try to make him king, but he goes to the mountain to pray. And as he looks out, the storm has come across the water. He watches his disciples as they struggle to fight against the wind and the waves. They only have a short distance to go. They're not going all the way across. only going a short distance, and for some reason, they can't make it. It's only a little ways. This week, I saw a man fishing in the bed. He was a young man. According to what he told me, he was 19 years old. He's a little bit bigger than me. And I watched him as he cast that line 
It was huge. The pole, the pole was probably eight foot tall. And as he threw that line out into the bay, and I watched it, and he started pulling it in, and all of a sudden he caught something. And I said, do you have something? He said, I'm not sure. And he started pulling. For half an hour, he pulled this thing in. You could see it wrestling. He said, he said to me, I want to hand you the pole. I said, don't give it to me, you're going to lose the pole. <laughs> And he was pulling, letting go, pulling, trying to reel, reel it in. And I'm looking, and all of a sudden, as he gets it to the shore, it's a stingray. And so he's trying to get it, and you can tell he's totally out of energy. And he gets it almost up on the rocks. And I said, what are you going to do with that? Because I'm thinking He said, I'm exhausted. So he went down to get it, and guess what happened? The stingray broke the line. Hook still in his mouth, and it flapped away. And I looked at him and I said, What were you going to do? He said, ah, I was going to let go anyways. I said, I'm sorry I had no pictures on my camera. Take pictures so you could tell your friends that, you know, you wrestled with a thing. He said, Man, I'm tired. He had exhausted his strength <coughs> pulling this in. And I thought, that's the way it was with the disciples. They had been fighting and fighting the wind and the waves. And according to John chapter 6, it says they gave themselves up for lost hope. They had given themselves up. They forgot that it was Jesus who said, go cross. Even though they didn't leave when he told them. You know, when God opens the door, go in it now. If you don't go in the door now, guess what? It's going to be hard to get in. But you know, Jesus was watching him the whole time. Why does God do that? Why does he always watch from a distance? Doesn't he act when we want to act? Says Jesus walked on water. Can you imagine? He didn't just walk on any water, he walked on stormy water. What's stormy water like? Have you ever seen it? How does he get his foot on there? Not smooth water. He walked on stormy water. You think he got wet? When he was on the shore, why didn't he say, Peace, be still? Could he have said it? Why did he have to walk on the water? This is the same Jesus that they woke up and said, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And he stood up and he said, Peace, be still. And what did the wind do? He said, bye, Jesus. What did the waves do? Couldn't he have said it as he was standing on the shore? The disciples said, it's a ghost. How can you know what a ghost is? Does anyone know what a ghost is? You think Jesus looks like a ghost? Well, apparently they thought Jesus looked like a ghost. Jesus said, Don't be afraid. It's me. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come. Peter came. What happened? But this is what John 6 says. But they told him to come into the boat. And when they did, they were where they wanted to be. Wait a minute. What happened? They couldn't get to their destination, but they invited Jesus in the boat, and they were there. They were where they wanted to be. They thought they were lost. They thought they would drown. But the minute they invited Jesus into the boat, they were where they wanted to be. 
What does a pastor say on his farewell? He's got to speak Revelation chapter 3. I've already mentioned the three angels' messages. But you got to mention John chapter 3. Because John chapter 3 is for the last day church before Jesus comes. I may not see you again. But the message of John, uh, Revelation 3, is a message for us. You're going to hear some parallels. So I hope you're not sleeping. Because Jesus already calmed the storm. You understand? He's already brought you to your destination. Revelation chapter 3. You know it well. To the angel of the church in legacy of verse 14, these are the words of the Amen. When you say Amen? After you pray? After a meal? When the service is over? The ruler of God's creation, not king of the Jews, he's the ruler of God's creation. It's Hebrews chapter 1 that says, God has spoken to us in these last days by his Son, who, through who he created the whole earth. It says, I know your deeds. How would you like your deeds published today? Good deeds, bad deeds. All deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich and I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Here it is. I counsel you to buy from me gold. Find in the what was the first thing these guys gave Jesus when he was born? They gave him gold. Jesus says, now I'm going to give you gold. But not just any gold. Do you know how people get gold today? Do you know why people buy their old computers and old phones? They have a little bit of gold. Did you know that? Yeah, you won't. that little bit of gold because it's so important. <clears throat> Jesus said, get my gold. How much do you think Jesus' gold was worth? $1,500 an ounce? No, that's human gold. How much is Jesus' gold worth? How much do you think? $2,000? How much would you give Jesus for his gold? <coughs> What else? What else did Jesus going to give? Going to give you some clothes. How do you like your clothes today? <coughs> Laura, I apologize. I meant to wear my wrong today um, because I wanted to be with the Filipinos today, but I didn't. Just left the house on her. But thank you. It's for me. What's Jesus giving today? What well, clothes is he given? He says, even though we're clothed today, we're naked. Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and guess what? They suddenly <coughs> realized. What else does Jesus want to put on? Sad. Just like what he was saying the myrrh, the sad, the ointment to put on. Listen to what he says. You know the verse well. John, uh, Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. No 
What's the next word? If anyone oh. Isn't it amazing? At the beginning of his life, he's born in a stable. He has nothing. There was no one opening the door for him. These wise men come from the east, and it says, they opened to him. It's the same word. It's the same word. They opened their treasures to him. They recognized who he was. And why does Jesus have to stand at the door and knock? Doesn't anyone recognize his voice anymore? It says his voice has gone throughout the whole earth. Does anyone listen? Why is it at the time of Samuel? It says, the lamb in the sanctuary had almost been extinguished. But somehow it's little Samuel that hears the voice of God. Not Eli. Not Hophni and Phineas. Little Samuel hears the voice. Who hears the voice of Jesus? Anybody? The Magi heard the voice of God. They opened their hearts to him. And Jesus says the same today. I'm standing. I'm not. I'm only not. Hear someone knocking on the door and you don't want to open it? How long are you going to let them knock? In sales, they told us if you don't hear a dog barking, you don't hear anyone coming from the door, give them two knocks and go. Don't waste your time. How often does Jesus knock? You ever heard the knocks? Have you ever opened? What happens if you open? Listen to what he says. I'll come in. I'm going to eat with you. You want Jesus eating with you? You sure? You know what's in the refrigerator? You know what's in the freezer? I visited someone this last week and they said, Pastor, I hope you don't get sick, but I'm cooking lamb today. And I've got a freezer full of beef back there. So it's okay with me. What do you got in there? You want Jesus to come in and eat with you? You know, if you ask him, he'll bring the food. He says, if you open the door, I will come in. What if you don't open the door? You can keep knocking. Yes. Even my daughter knew. God, you love everybody. Even though our life is as short as a fruit fly. You love and forgive everybody. And you want everybody to be saved. Jesus says, those who overcome, you get to sit on my throne. How would you like to sit on Jesus' throne? What do you think it looks like? How big is it? Is he only expecting one person to share the throne? How many people can he fit on that throne? How big is it? And you're going to sit down with the Father. What's that going to be like? You want to sit down with the Father or you just want to sit down with Jesus? They're the same. You've seen me. God sent his son into the world to save him. Today, Jesus is not. Who's in hope? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can be here. And the story of the Magi as they traveled.
from east to west. Sounds like it took them two years to follow that star. But they were not disappointed. It says when they saw Jesus, they fell down and worshipped him. Even though he was just a baby, there was something about him. And then they opened their treasures to him. Father, even the disciples, as they fought the winds and the waves, when they took Jesus in the boat, they were at their destination. Father, we're all traveling from this world to the next. It's just a resting place. And yes, our lives are very short. We don't know what will happen. We don't know if next week we'll still be here. That's why today you're not here. Father, there may be somebody here that's thought about opening the door, but they never did. They hear the knocking, it hasn't changed. But today there may be somebody here, Lord, that says, Lord, I want to open that door. I want to eat with you. I want to sit down with the Father on His throne. I want to experience the eternal life that you have. Is there anyone that would like to just raise their hand? Father, you see all the hands that have gone up. Honor our faith today. May we keep that door open. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
surprise last week when the conference came down and they could not be here today. And that's why they didn't make it here or they would have come here instead of going there. Uh, but that was the only sad that they didn't make it. Uh, and they, they wanted to be there when Christine was there. And Christine's not here and she's sorry. The school started again and she's down there. Uh, but she's enjoyed it. In fact, uh, Livermore always said she was here more than she was there. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, she spent a lot of her time here working with the choir and, uh, and everything. So, um, thank you, Ray. I guess I can turn this one back on. So let's see what, you want me to open it all? Okay. Hey, you want to help Daddy open it? What is this? What is this? Oh, it says something on it. Let's see what it says. Harry, are you getting all this? <laughs> Thank you. I just can't forget to say, and mention when Pastor Dodge was we was in the Brazil uh, church. Did you see the old rugged cross? Pastor Dodge had uh, also another free church, Burger King, South San Francisco, Redwood City, and still going with us to Mountain View. Did you guys see all that? Uh, the old rugged cross? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pastor Dodge. Yeah, that's when I was younger, though. That's when I was single. <laughs> Look at it. Yeah. I, I was single then. And, uh, what? Um, yeah, four churches. Okay, and then, oh, look, another plaque. Let's see. Oh, you guys need to see this. See this? And I'll have it upstairs. And I hope that you're all staying uh, um, to, uh, to see all this and staying by. Uh, Fremont Seventh-day Adventist Church and sincere appreciation of, for your dedication and years of service. September 1 through May 31st, Pastor Tom Dodge. This will go on the, um, on my, uh, uh, where all my plaques and everything go. And, um, the conference did give me a, a watch that was engraved for all my years of service. Um, so for 38 years, uh, I've been in the ministry for 38 years, so... Thank you so much, Church. I'll always have this as a memory, and uh, you know that uh, you know when uh, when the elders here uh, need a break from preaching, they can always ask. Uh, but you have you have good good elders here that will take care of the church, and I know we're getting to start a new officer year starting um, August first, and so uh, we'll be working on that. But you've been a great church. Uh, I still can't believe that it's gone by that quickly. Uh, I think most of you know when I met with you, uh, you asked how long I would be here because you knew of my age. When I came, I was uh, 62. Oh, yeah, I was 62. So I told you I would be here three to five years, so four years. Um, and the reason we made that decision was because Christine's in school. And um, so we want to be with her. It's hard on Cadiz without her mother. And um, so, but thank you. I'm always available. You guys know that. And uh, so, did you want to have a, a closing prayer? Or? Uh, for the, um, oh. Make sure you stay home. Everybody, please stay for potluck as we will have more to share upstairs yeah. during the potluck. And you can socialize with Pastor to and have a fellowship together. Um, may we ask Pastor Cabal, do you have a special prayer? Until you broke and then you not seven of the Tom Dodge to come and take care of this church as an under shepherd. What a time, what a time, what a time it has been, oh God. Through his humble leadership, loving Father, this church has grown and continues to grow. My Lord and my God, your main servant has fought a good fight. He has run the race and he has finished the fight. Lord, his hands are still holding on to the gospel far. He will still be plowing 
until you appear in the cloud of glory to give him the sweet release. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. But until then, Lord, may you refuel his guest time. May he continue to run errands for God in this country and in nations beyond. May you bless the wife, bless the daughter Therese, that loving Jesus you will give them good health to enjoy the years of retirement. Most importantly, loving Father, may you answer and accept the prayer that Fremont Church will be praying for this family, even as they transition. We commit them dear into your hands, both now and forevermore. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand up for our benediction? Thank <laughs> you. 